Shoulder. Arm. No, 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 no. How many times do I have to tell you? That shoulder is wrong. What year do you think it is? 1895? The advance is the new shoulder. The advance is the new shoulder? The advance is the new shoulder. If the advance is the new shoulder, then is the old shoulder the new advance? Extra drill. As mentioned in part one of this video, the manual exercise underwent substantial changes in 1896. Although usages generally remained similar, in some cases the positions themselves and the movements between them changed. The experiments, or changes in the early 1890s, were in some cases reversed, as with the present arms, while other positions, such as the advance, were abolished. Well, in name anyway, as we shall see. This new manual exercise would be used throughout the remainder of the 1890s and on into the 20th century, when, in 1903, the short magazine Lee Enfield was adopted and the manual exercise was changed to reflect the requirements of this new weapon. An interesting footnote to the 96 manual exercise was the reintroduction of marching in slow time. This evolution had been abolished in 1892, but was reintroduced and included in most formal ceremonial occasions. In this video, part two of the Lee Metford manual exercise, we'll examine the way things changed after 1896. Many positions remained the same, albeit with some modification in the movements required to adopt them. The reference for this video is the rifle and carbine exercises of 1896. But indeed that of 1898 would do just fine, as they're both identical. Much like in part one of this series, We'll review the positions and their usages, then go into detail about the way the drill was performed. As in the first part, we'll start with the most basic position, the order. This remained the position of attention when under arms. It was also a position of transition from the more relaxed stand at ease and stand easy to all other positions. The stand at ease also remained the same. There continued to be two positions, one for use when the bayonets were not fixed, with another for use when they were. The position of shoulder arms perhaps represents the biggest change in the manual exercise in use from 1896. The position of advance arms, as was used before 96, was renamed and repurposed as the shoulder. Its use as a formal way of carrying the rifle remained unchanged. Here we see troops on parade pre-96 on the island of Malta. They're holding their weapons at the old shoulder, vertically held at the left side by the butt plate. Post-96, the same parade looked like this, with the rifles held by the trigger guard vertically at the right side. Another example of this transition are these two photographs of a battalion's guard out front of the guardroom. Here, the guard of a battalion of the Gordon Highlanders stands at the old pre-96 shoulder, with the NCOs on the right flank holding their weapons at the advance. After 96, it looked like this. Here, the guard of a battalion of the Buffs stands at the shoulder. Note the position of the NCOs on the right flank, the same as the men. In this photograph, taken on the island of Crete in 1897, we see the old guard of the 1st Battalion Seaforth Highlanders and the new guard, formed by the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, both standing at the shoulder. It's also interesting to note that these changes were promulgated throughout the Empire. Here we see a guard from the 5th Royal Scots of Canada standing in line at the shoulder. This also shows that despite the fact that these troops are armed with the Snyder, they're using the drill respectively for the new, modern Lee Metford. As was mentioned earlier, the reintroduction of slow time saw the rifle carried at the shoulder for the purposes of various ceremonial evolutions. When marching in slow time, the disengaged arm continued to be checked to the side, while when marching in quick time, 
The disengaged arm was swung naturally from the shoulder, not higher than the waist belt. The slope was also a position carried over from the earlier versions of the manual exercise. Its importance in the field, due to its balance and comfort, was matched from 1896 with an increased importance in ceremonial evolutions. It became, much to the lament of some traditionalists, the position used for marching past in quick time while in column, supplanting the position of shoulder arms used for this purpose up until that time. Of course, it remained the standard position to carry the rifle during most field maneuvers, both on the line of march in fours or in column, and also in extended order if the rifles were loaded or magazines charged. Otherwise, in extended order, the rifles were carried at the trail. Here, we see a detachment of the Seaforth Highlanders marching past some international admirals on the island of Crete. They're in fours at the slope. As it was with the shoulder, the disengaged arm was swung naturally from the shoulder, no higher than the waist belt. The slope could also be used while marching in double time. The trail remained as it had been in the previous iteration of the manual exercise. When used in quick time, the disengaged arm was swung in the normal fashion, while the position was also used while marching in double time. As was the case pre-96, the trail was used for march pasts in quarter column, both in quick and double time. The position of the present was maintained as a formal way of saluting when under arms. Here we see the new guard and the old guard as part of the changing of the guard ceremony saluting each other at the present. The present was also used to salute certain armed parties, or indeed officers of field rank, by sentries or other static individuals. The port remained the position for the passing of sentries and the inspection of arms on parade. Here we see a sentry and his relief being briefed on their duties by their sergeant, both holding their rifles at the port. And here a sentry giving a briefing to his officer of his position and duties. In this era, the port was also used in the initial stages of delivering the charge. More on that next. The position of charged bayonets was used to present the bayonet to the front, for either personal protection or for offensive action. An example of the use of this position is the challenge afforded to an oncoming unknown party by a sentry standing guard at a specific point. Comes there. Friend. Pass, friend. All's well. Now this, like the example given in part one, is a highly stylized version of the proceedings. The bayonet would only be brought to the charge if the sentry was at risk of a sudden rush by an unknown enemy. The use in this case of a friendly oncoming soldier is for demonstrative purposes only. Actually changing from the older version in 1893, the technique for delivering the charge included three positions, the slope, the port, and the charge. The men, formed up in relatively close order, advanced at the slope. Then, on the word of command to prepare to charge, the front rank only brought their rifles to the port. And on the word of command charge, they adopted the position of charge bayonets and advanced at the double upon the enemy. As was typical, bugles were sounded, pipes were played, and the men cheered. Although the position of secure arms changed in detail, its purpose remained the same. It was used primarily by sentries in inclement weather to protect the action. One of the benefits of examining the manual exercise from the last half of the 1890s is the fact that there are some surviving examples of some of the earliest moving pictures taken. We see the arrival of the guard at St. James Palace. Note the guardsman standing at the corner at the shoulder. The substantial band rounds the corner, obviously marching in quick time. As the band and corps of drums move out of camera shot, we see the arrival of the two divisions of the guard. They too are marching in quick time, with the weapons held at the shoulder. Presumably, they would have transitioned to this position from the slope, further back up the road. As the first division halts and is dressed by the NCO on the right flank, we see the second division come up to take its position on the left. In another shot from the same reel, we see the departure of the guard. The protocol states that the guard is to exit the forecourt in slow time, 
weapons held at the shoulder. Note the left arms checked at the side. In this clip, we see a parade for the return of a volunteer battalion from the Boer War. This is interesting because it shows a on-the-move transition from the slope to the shoulder in preparation for a halt. Of note, especially at this later date, is the mixture of rifles carried by these troops. Some are armed with Mark I Star Lee Metfords, while others are armed with the Mark II variant, or indeed Mark I Magazine Lee Enfields. This last clip is simply another one demonstrating the use of the slope while marching in fours. Now that the positions and their usages have been explained, in this next part of the video, we'll explain and demonstrate the actual positions and movements used between them. As mentioned earlier, the reference is rifle and carbine exercises from 1896. Now, as in part one, if the minutia of the manual exercise is not particularly to your liking, I'd invite you to skip forward to the 24 minute and 20 second mark. At that point, the video will pick up with the review exercise, as well as some historical commentary at the end. Like all manual exercise, it was taught first to the recruit by numbers. For ease of presentation, we'll start with movements from the order. Stand at ease without bayonets. Stand at ease! On the word of command stand at ease, the rifle was thrust forward to the extent of the right arm. Simultaneously, the right foot was brought back behind the heel of the left. The weight was shifted to the rear. Attention from stand at ease. Attention! On the word of command, the right foot was brought up in line with the left, and the rifle brought back to the position of order arms. Stand at ease with bayonets fixed. Stand at ease. On the word of command, the feet were moved in the usual way. But the hands were clapped in front of the body at waist level, right hand uppermost, and then they were drawn down in front of the body. The rifle was cradled in the crook of the right arm. Attention from stand at ease with bayonets. Attention! On the word of command, the right foot was moved back up in line with the left. Simultaneously, the hands were moved back to the position of order arms. Shoulder arms from the order. Shoulder arms. Two. In the first part, the weapon was thrown up with a flick of the right wrist and caught with the right hand in a peculiar fashion. Shown here, notice the particular placement of the first and second fingers. The remaining fingers were kept straight. The left hand was brought across and stabilized the weapon at waist level. In the second part, the left hand was cut away to the position of attention. Order arms from the shoulder. Order arms. Two. Three. In the first part, the left hand was brought across and gripped the weapon just underneath the nose cap. In the second part, the left hand lowered the weapon down to the position of order arms. The right hand re-gripped the weapon at the barrel band. In the third part, the left hand was cut away to the position of attention and the weapon lowered quietly to the ground. Slope arms from the order. Slope arms. Two. Three. In the first part, with a flick of the right wrist, the weapon was drawn up parallel to the body and re-gripped with the right hand at the small of the butt and the left hand at waist level. In the second part, the right hand re-gripped the small of the butt in an all-around grip and transitioned the weapon to the left shoulder, where the left hand re-gripped the butt plate. The left elbow was bent at a 90-degree angle. In the third part, the right hand was cut away to the position of attention. Order arms from the slope. Order arms. Two, three. In the first part, the left hand re-gripped the butt of the rifle so that the back of the hand faced up. In the second part, the left arm was straightened, bringing the rifle to a perpendicular position where it was caught with the right hand at the barrel band. In the third part, 
The right hand brought the weapon down to the right side to the position of order arms. The left hand remained at the position of attention. Trail arms from the order. Trail arms! On the word of command, arms, with a flick of the right wrist, the rifle was brought up, parallel to the ground, and caught at the point of balance. Order arms from the trail. Order arms! On the word of command, arms, the weapon was brought back to the order by shifting the grip of the right hand to the barrel band and allowing the butt to drop to the ground. Fix bayonets at the order. Fix bayonets. Two. Three. On the word of command fix, the marker moved forward and took up his position in front of the front rank. On the word of command bayonets, the rifle was forced forward slightly, and the left hand gripped the bayonet with the thumb pointed to the rear. In the second part, the left hand then withdrew the bayonet from the scabbard and fixed it to the muzzle of the rifle, simultaneously moving the head and eyes to the right. Note how the left hand draws the bayonet slightly forward, flipping it over blade up, then placing it on the muzzle over top of the clearing rod. In the third part, on the command from the marker, the rifle was brought back to the position of order arms and the left hand cut away. Unfix bayonets at the order. Unfix bayonets. Two. Three. On the word of command unfix, the left marker moved forward of the front rank. On the word of command bayonets, the rifle was moved and gripped between the knees. Simultaneously, the head was turned to the left. As the rifle was brought between the knees, the left hand moved to a position by the upper barrel band and depressed the bayonet catch. The right hand came and gripped the hilt of the bayonet, and the two together moved the bayonet one inch off the muzzle. Taking the time from the left marker, the bayonet was then removed from the rifle and placed tip first into the scabbard. Once this was complete, the right hand resumed its grip by the barrel band, and the left hand was returned to the position of attention at the left side. In the third part, again taking the time from the left marker, the rifle was returned to the position of order arms and the head and eyes moved to the front. Movements from the shoulder. Present arms. Present arms. Two. Three. In the first part, the right hand raised the rifle up approximately one inch and re-gripped it at the small of the butt with the arm straight and the fingers together. The left hand came across and steadied the weapon at elbow level. In the second part, the right hand brought the weapon up so that it was positioned centrally in front of the body. As it did so, the weapon was turned so that the magazine pointed straight to the left. The left hand quit its position and was placed smartly as the rifle came up to the front in front of the magazine, finger straight, with the fingertip in line with the mouth. In the third part, the rifle was dropped down perpendicular to the body and twisted so the magazine pointed straight to the front. Note the change in grip of both hands, the right from an all-around to finger straight, and the left from a flat finger straight to an all-around grip with the thumb uppermost. Simultaneous to this, the right foot was placed with its instep at the left heel. Shoulder arms from the present. Shoulder! Arms! Two! In the first part, the rifle was repositioned with the left hand at the right side. The right hand quit the small of the butt and gripped the weapon in the position of shoulder arms. Simultaneous to this, the feet were brought back to the position of attention. In the second part, the left hand was cut away to the position of attention. Port arms from the shoulder. Port! In the first part, the weapon was gripped as in the first part of the present. In the second part, the weapon was brought up so that it was positioned at a 45 degree angle across the front of the chest. The right hand changed to an all around grip and the rifle was oriented magazine down. Shoulder arms from the port. Shoulder arms! 
two. In the first part, the left hand moved the weapon to a perpendicular position at the right side. Simultaneous to this, the right hand regripped in the position of shoulder arms. In the second part, the left hand was cut away to the position of attention. Charge bayonets from the shoulder. As for front rank, charge bayonet. Two. In the first part, the weapon was gripped as in the first position of present arms. In the second part, the left hand brought the weapon down, oriented to the front, though slightly elevated. Simultaneous to this, the body was pivoted on the heels so that the left foot oriented to the front and the right foot to the right. Shoulder arms from charged bayonets. Shoulder arms. Two. In the first part, the rifle was brought back to a position perpendicular at the right side, with the right hand re-gripping in the position of shoulder arms. Simultaneous to this, the body was pivoted back to the front on the heels. In the second part, the left hand was cut away to the position of attention. Trail arms from the shoulder. Trail arms! Two! In the first part, the left hand came across and gripped the weapon at the barrel band. In the second part, the right hand quit its position at the trigger guard, re-gripped at the point of balance, the weapon was dropped down parallel to the ground, and the left hand cut away to the position of attention. Shoulder arms from the trail. Shoulder arms! Two! In the first part, the right wrist and elbow were bent, bringing the weapon to a position perpendicular to the ground. Simultaneously, the left hand came across and gripped the weapon at the barrel band, steadying it, and the right hand re-gripped the rifle in the position of advance arms. In the third part, the left hand was cut away to the position of attention. Secure arms from the shoulder. Secure arms! Two! In the first part, the left hand came across and gripped the weapon at elbow level. In the second part, the left hand brought the weapon down in an arc to the front. The right hand quit its position on the trigger guard and cradled the rifle just in front of the magazine. As the rifle reached its final point, the left hand was cut away to the position of attention. Shoulder arms from the secure. Shoulder arms! Two! In the first part, the left hand came across and raised the rifle to a perpendicular position at the right side. Simultaneous to this, the right hand quit its grip and re-gripped in the position of shoulder arms. In the second part, the left hand was cut away to the position of attention. Movements from the slope. Trail arms. Trail arms. Two. In the first part, the right hand came across and gripped the weapon at the point of balance in front of the magazine. In the second part, the right hand brought the weapon down so that it was parallel to the ground and the left hand cut away to the position of attention. Slope arms from the trail. Slope! Arms! Two! In the first part, the right hand gripped the weapon and moved it to a position 45 degrees on the left shoulder. The left hand came up and gripped the butt plate in the position of slope arms. In the second part, the right hand was cut away to the position of attention. Port arms from the slope. Port arms! Two! In the first part, the right hand came across and gripped the small of the butt with an all-around grip. In the second part, the right hand brought the weapon down to a position 45 degrees in front of the chest. The left hand re-gripped the rifle in front of the magazine. Slope arms from the port. Slope arms! Two! In the first part, the right hand placed the rifle 45 degrees on the left shoulder. Simultaneous to this, the left hand re-gripped the butt in the position of slope arms. In the second part, the right hand was cut away to the position of attention. The review exercise. As it was before 1896, the review exercise was a series of movements that a unit might be put through to gauge efficiency and ability in the manual exercise. As was mentioned in part one, this, like all drill performed by trained men, was done in quick time, observing a pause of quick time between the parts of the movement. Shoulder!
Present! Arch! Shoulder! Arch! Order! Arch! Fix! Bayonets! Shoulder! Arms! Charge! Bennett! Shoulder! Arms! Slow! Arms! Order! Arms! Unfix! Bennett! So this concludes the comprehensive look at the manual exercise for the Lee Metford rifle, both pre and post-1896. Whether you're an historical shooter looking for greater context, or perhaps a reenactor looking for the correct manual exercise to perform for a Boer War impression, I hope this somewhat long series of videos will go some way to filling those knowledge gaps. I might take this opportunity to mention a little bit more about the kit worn in the video. During the era of the 1890s, typically the personal equipment of the infantryman was the pattern 1888 or Slade Wallace valise equipment. Apart from the rolled greatcoat and mess tin strapped to the back of the belt, one of the most peculiar features of this was the small valise perched high atop the shoulders. To properly represent the full array of marching order as it was worn on home service, I constructed a valise made out of oil skin and leather. It was fitted to the equipment through D-rings placed on the braces just behind the shoulder strap. It held a soldier's necessities, but was typically not worn on campaign, it instead being carried in unit transport. In addition, I also have to make mention of the location of some of these shoots. Fort Rod Hill, near Victoria, British Columbia, is a Victorian fort guarding the entrance to the naval base in Esquimalt. Its primary purpose was to house three six-inch disappearing mount breech-loading guns. These were distributed with two in the lower battery and one in the upper. It formed part of the network of defenses in and about the naval base. It also forms, in the modern era, the home of the Victoria Esquimalt Military Reenactors Association. One of their members, and a friend of the channel, Branco, suggested that I might come along on a very appropriate date. Well, for this channel anyway. In the capital of British Columbia, Victoria, on Victoria Day long weekend, the association held a comprehensive military display with the theme of Canada and her allies. My reception there on this weekend was warm and welcoming, and I'm indebted for their kind gesture of the use of the grounds during their event. As you've seen in parts of these two videos on the Lee Metford, as well as an upcoming one on the Martini Henry, the location fit like a glove. 